Hello and welcome to Ways to Change the World. I'm Christian Guru Murthy, and this is the podcast in which we talk to extraordinary people about the big ideas in their lives and the events that have helped shape them. My guest this week is simply the youngest MP in the House of Commons. Nadia Wisson was elected in 2019 to represent the seat of Nottingham East at the age of 23. She's a member of the Socialist Campaign Group, big supporter of Jeremy Corbyn. She's well known as having limited her own salary as an MP to £35,000 after tax, and she gives the rest away to charity. As for her bigger political ambitions, well, it's not clear because she's already resigned um, in her career as a parliamentary aide to one of Keir Starmer's uh, front bench people. So, Nadia, welcome to the podcast. Hello, Christian. Thank you for having me. Now, I'm guessing that you're in politics because you've got really big ambitions and ideas about changing the world. Well, no to the former, yes to the latter. I first got involved in politics when I was 16. It was when the bedroom tax was introduced and that's something that really affected my local area and, and people around me. And that's what angered me into action, I suppose. So for me, politics has really never been something that I've seen as a career or even as an option for a career. It's been about my lived experience and the lived experience of my community of being decimated by 10 years of austerity and benefits cuts and the insecurity that my generation has really been defined by, whether that's job insecurity, housing insecurity. So I came into politics as an activist to make a change. Well, what is your lived experience? Well, for me, I was 13 when the coalition government was elected. So I, I've i really grown up under Tory governments. And at the time, my my mum was out of work because of illness. So it was like for, for many families, it was quite a struggle. But also the area that I, I lived in and live in now is one that is has been really badly affected by austerity. There are a lot of people who are forced to use food banks, people who are working several jobs just to make ends meet. People who, who I know who, because of lack of opportunity, have ended up going down the wrong path and being criminalised for it. When, when you look in the in the chamber of the House of Commons, there are people who boast about using Class A drugs, with no repercussions. And in terms of your background, um, I mean, what's what's your ethnicity? What's your your origin? I'm. Asian, so my dad is Punjabi and my mum's Anglo-Indian. When you say Anglo-Indian, that means different things to different people. Can you just explain what you mean by it? So both my grandparents are Anglo-Indian and great-grandparents, so Indian with some European mix. So it's, 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 not, it's not sort of half and half, you know, what, what one white parent, one Asian parent. It's just there's a, there's a group of people um, in India known as Anglo-Indians um who have got a mixed heritage yeah and, and that's that's where one side of your family comes from yeah it's interesting because lots of people think that it's half and half but actually in my family we don't have any anglo ancestry as such but there's some european and um irish and stuff I mean, one of the really interesting things about anglo indians just while we're there is a sort of a slight dog leg is that they have often suffered discrimination um, by by Indians um, as not quite Indian enough. Um, is that something you, you've been aware of or experienced yourself? I've learned more about that later in life after researching Anglo-Indian communities. And I was quite surprised, in fact, to find out that the the levels of poverty and deprivation and homelessness and unemployment amongst the Anglo-Indian community in in India are very, very high and disproportionately high. But I suppose for me, my grandparents came here in the 50s and my dad's first generation. So my my experience has very much been one of a, a second generation person. 
And where, where did you grow up? I mean, and, and how much has, you know, has race and racism framed your, your growing up? I grew up in Nottingham. I was born and bred in Nottingham and I've lived across different areas of Nottingham. I guess my life, like every person of colour, has been shaped by racism, both experiences of racism, but also just the structural racism that exists in our society. And um, that that is something else that drove me into politics, particularly seeing the ways in which austerity was disproportionately affecting people of colour and particularly women of colour. I want to talk about all of those things that are really important to you, but I think we should concentrate just for a while on, you know, the, the issue that has been gripping the nation for the last couple of weeks, again, in a very high profile way, following the killing of Sarah Everard, and that's violence against women. And and what's going on has been described in all sorts of different ways um, by different people. So how, how do you see it? What do you think this reaction is really about? I think it's a collective grieving for Sarah Everard, but also for all women who have been impacted by male violence, including most severely being killed by men. So Christina Abbotts, who was a sex worker killed by her clients, Naomi Hersey, a trans woman who was killed by a a man she met on a dating site. And it's also a resistance. As I said in Parliament when I was speaking against the policing bill, we marched because we're angry, because we're hurting, because we are sick of male violence, whether that is at the hands of the state, the hands of family members, acquaintances, strangers, or of course, partners or former partners, as it so often is. A a partner or former partner kills a woman, two women every week. And I, I think coming back to that, that sense of collective grieving and trauma, Every woman I know has experienced male violence somewhere on that spectrum of violence, from sexual harassment to assault and rape. And we're not saying that to elicit sympathy. We don't want sympathy. We want change. And that's what marching is about. And and why do you think this particular case is the one that has ignited? You know, in a very similar way to the way George Floyd's killing in America last year ignited something because the cases you mentioned you know of of black women who were killed or trans women you know didn't it's certainly the case that women of color black women trans women and sex workers in particular are are excluded and in in many ways from the conversation around feminism both excluded in wider patriarchal society but also excluded within parts of the feminist movement as well and that's why we need to well we need to both decolonize the the movements that we occupy and also wider society i think that the killing of sarah everard has really been a watershed moment for for the country it's a a very haunting reminder that not every woman survives male violence. Is it that with Sarah Everard, what we've seen is what appears to be an abduction and murder by a stranger, which is very rare, but it's made everybody think about the majority of violence, male violence against women, which is domestic, which is by people they know. I think it's it's partly that this is a woman, Sarah Everard was walking home, women should be able to walk home. The public realm belongs to women too, and we should be able to go wherever we choose without fear of violence or harassment or the very worst. I think it's also because the person charged is a serving metropolitan police officer. The reason why I think that in particular has also been a watershed moment is that I I think we can often think about abusers as something else over there, different people, like monsters almost, when actually male violence exists on a spectrum. And it's not something that happens externally from the rest of society. 
it's sometimes the same people who are supposed to be protecting us are, are the people perpetrating violence. But the question is male violence, and that's the phrase you keep using. So can we talk about that for, for, for a second in terms of how you see that? I mean, because again, this is something that, you know, there's a lot of pushback on that, you know, it's not all men, it's only some men, um, but that all men have a responsibility to be allies in this. I mean, we seem to be in a bit of a mess about it. <laughs> How do you see this? Obviously, it's not all men, but it is all women. We know that it's all women. And I think when when people say not all men, or or even that another thing that has often been spoken spoken about is that more men are killed than women. Like, this isn't a competition. This is about prevention. And I think when we misdiagnose the problem, we don't reach the solution. So violence against women by men is entrenched in society. It's perpetuated by gender inequality. On the other hand, men tend to be killed in random attacks. It's They're not crimes of power and they're not crimes that are are disproportionately committed by partners. But the the similarities are that this is all an issue of male violence. And that's because the patriarchy and misogyny impacts men too. It's it's the reason why men aren't are often not able to speak about their feelings, are disproportionately dying from suicide. So, so do you think the patriarchy is central to why some men are violent? Absolutely. I think it. the reason why there is such a huge explosion of raw emotion and grief and anger around this is that this isn't about one isolated incident. This is about the, the life experiences of roughly 50% of the population, the root cause of all of those things is patriarchy. And that's why we need to we need to dismantle patriarchy. We need fundamental social material and policy change. So how, how does that take you to what you do as an MP and what you think is achievable? So I guess if I start with social change... I think it's important to say that we need to go beyond individual policies. We need to learn to better identify direct and indirect influences of misogyny and patriarchy on our streets, in our homes, in our own minds. I think that another important element of social change is the language that we use. I think we need to stop using passive language about male violence. So, for example... The, the statistic that 97% of young women have experienced sexual harassment should be men have sexually harassed 97% of young women. Um, I, I think as well, more broadly, socially, men haven't really had a, a positive, empowered conversation about what post-equality masculinity looks like. And I think that conversation is long overdue. There's a whole load of policy that needs to change. So in 1986, the UK signed up to the UN Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. That still hasn't been fully implemented. The government needs to reverse cuts to domestic violence services, sexual violence services, reverse welfare cuts, which have disproportionately fallen on women, and also reform the welfare system so that it's not the case that a woman can only receive a single payment of universal credit to one bank account because that makes it more difficult to leave an abusive partner. The government needs to reverse legal aid cuts because that has curtailed and blocked women's access to justice. And it's also meant that when women have been pursued in civil courts, that they haven't had that that recourse to to legal aid sufficiently. And then more widely than that, we need proper pay, we need secure jobs and secure housing so that women can 
leave abusive partners, but also just on a very fundamental and basic level, have lives that are equal to men's. So this this brings you back to your central motivation for going into politics, which is about poverty and about people's lived experience when they are struggling. You think that is the central way to tackle the gender imbalances. But I mean, do do you think, do, do we need to go beyond that? So, you know, do... Does every law have to have a gender impact assessment, you know, and, and we thought about it in that way and, and, you know, for race and disability and every other marginalised group uh, when it comes to the way we live? I think when you look at the fact that austerity has so disproportionately impacted women and people of colour and disabled people, the numbers of disabled people who have died as a result of austerity shows me that yes, we do. And I, I think the the research that I commissioned by the House of Commons Library that showed that 92% of the Treasury savings since 2010 from tax and benefits cuts have been shouldered by women shows that there is something very badly wrong here that absolutely needs to change. We need to also particularly look at the most marginalised women So trans women and sex workers in particular. And I think we need to be listening to those groups of women. So sex workers all across the country are organising and calling for decriminalisation of sex work because it would make them safer in the here and now. So legislators need to listen to that and take, take the action that's required for for women to be safe today and of course if if we're going to have a discussion about sex work then lots of people are are pushed into sex work by poverty and by the benefit system so that that's another reason for for those systems needing to change but we also need material change now in in terms of achieving change do you think you've done the right thing by becoming an mp i mean do you feel you have any power Yes, I think I've done the right thing because I, I'm i here to represent my constituents, the people of Nottingham East, and it's the, the biggest privilege and honour of my life to do that. I'm also here to, to represent working people across the country. And I guess I'm, I'm also in Parliament as a representative of my generation, a generation that, as I've said, has been defined by insecurity and I think largely unheard in politics, though we have made ourselves heard through things like climate strikes and rent strikes. And, and how do other MPs treat you as a 24-year-old? You know, do, do they patronise you? Do they take you seriously? Are you treated like any other MP or different? Yeah, it's very, it's mixed, as you'd imagine, it's mixed. Um, I, get, I get heckled a lot by Tory MPs, and not just me, but a lot of the the young women on the Labour benches, particularly the young women of colour, and women at all, actually, get heckled disproportionately. I I think it's important not to get too comfortable in Parliament, and sometimes it is an uncomfortable place. But I didn't come to Parliament to sort of become part of the fabric of the institution. I, I went there to be part of changing that institution. I mean, I remember interviewing Mary Black about this um, a while ago, and I mean, she, you know, she said there were really dreadful things about Parliament, um, you know, and that people behaved appallingly. Have you have you found that as well? God, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's been so well documented. One of my colleagues, Abna Apongasari, the um, Shadow Treasury Minister, when when we first, she's from my intake was elected in 2019. And when we first got there, there was a, a male Tory MP who handed her his bag because he assumed that he, he assumed that she was a member of staff and also that it was okay to treat members of staff like that. It's not uncommon for me to be mixed up with other MPs. Zara Sultana and I often get mistaken for each other Black women MPs often get mistaken for each other. But how did it actually happen? You know, how on earth did you 
get elected at 23? How did you get selected? You know, it's not like you went to public school and had networks and parents and friends and all the rest of it who could just push you in the right place. Um, how did it actually happen? Well, the incumbent MP for Nottingham East created his own party. So the Labour Party had a vacancy for, for the Labour candidate in the next general election, which came sooner than we expected. So I I was contacted by a lot of friends and activists and community organisations in Nottingham who said, why don't you stand? This is an opportunity for us to do something together. But I mean, you know, was that... A, su- a surprise or was that always the plan you know once you'd become active in politics as a teenager and had joined community groups in the Labour Party was that where you were heading or was it literally a moment of somebody saying well why don't you run and you go and you then having to think about it it's not something that has ever been a career option to me I I wanted to go to university and I wanted to to get to get a job like for for my generation I don't think we have those dreams in the same way that maybe previous generations have because we we've been so surrounded by insecurity and lack of opportunity that it's it's not so much a question of what job did you always want to do but I I just wanted to be secure in a job and I knew that education was the way for the way to achieve that even though I knew that I would be saddled with enormous debt and in the end it, it was too expensive to carry on at university and I dropped out and worked as a hate crime worker but no to, to answer your question in short it, it wasn't the plan. I mean when you say you dropped out because it wasn't financially viable anymore I mean just explain that because you know a lot of people see young people saying things are worse for us now or you know that there's less security for us now and on a simple level yeah we get that you know you've got to pay fees in a way that my generation didn't you rack up debt in a way that my generation didn't you know but on the other hand you know there are still loads of opportunities out there for people having careers and you see people taking them up all the time and in your own case even though you know you, you say you you sought financial security you ended up being elected to the establishment. Now, it may not be a secure job in the, the tradi- traditional sense, no, but, I'm, but you've I'm broken every kind of normal glass ceiling. Yeah, I'm, I'm extremely privileged. And even though I was a pretty ordinary working class person on the 12th of December, on the 13th of December, I, I am somebody with immense privilege. And even though I'm, I'm in opposition, I'm still somebody who walks the corridors of power. Um, I think the fact that I was looking for temp jobs before my selection and during my selection, actually I was, I was working part-time, but I was looking for other temp jobs to, to help financially um, is, is testament to just how insecure the job market is for young people. For me at university, I, I was working as a care worker and even that wasn't, enough to be able to to tide me over sometimes I also had to resit my first year at university which I hadn't made financial provision for when I decided to go to university and that meant that I was there for an additional year and that made it unaffordable but that's that's not uncommon in, in terms of sort of the actual ideas and, and what you're talking about, how, how confident do you feel? I mean, when I was 24, I was a reporter on Newsnight and I remember being really patronised when I was... I was a sort of a bright young thing in TV and I remember being patronised as sort of, you know, far too young to be doing what I was doing and thinking this is really annoying and I'm perfectly good at... You know, I'm perfectly able to do this. But at the same time, I did have a bit of imposter syndrome and thinking, you know... I don't have those decades of lived experience of covering X, Y, and Z and knowing all of these things. You know, is that just an inevitable product of being 24 and in Parliament? I just sort of wonder how that feels. I think one of the things that young people are constantly told and one of the things that I was told when I stood for selection and and stood for election is that young people don't have life experience when, in fact, I think it's the opposite. We do have life experience. You can have... A lot of life experience in 24 years and the fact is that 
that our life experience is different to the life experiences that are currently being represented in Parliament and represented in the media and in society. I, I guess in being in the House of Commons makes me realise that there's a lot of bluff going on. There are a lot of people who are there who don't know what they're talking about, who don't know anything about what happens in our communities, who have never had to go hungry or have never had to live on benefits, have never had to work in a low-wage job, have never had the experience of a street cooking for each other because some people on the street can't afford food. So I, I completely reject the argument that me or other people like me don't have knowledge, experience and expertise. Can, can I also just spend a little bit of time um, on the question of trans women? Um, because you've mentioned it a few times and I just want to explore what you think, you know, and what, what the answer is. Because it, again, it seems to me that feminism is in a terrible mess over this. Can't, you know, has created different camps in which women are arguing with each other uh, about, about women's rights and who is a woman and who is not. Uh, and this seems sort of an insane situation to be in. What do, you, what do you think is the way out of this current cul-de-sac? I think we need to root this conversation in people's lived experiences, people's real life experiences, and remember that when we talk about trans rights, this isn't some kind of abstract debate, this is something that impacts people's lives. Hate crimes towards trans people have gone up 40% in the last year. Trans people are having to wait at least two years to um, have medical treatment, or medical appointment even. Um, trans people are disproportionately victims of domestic violence, sexual violence, disproportionately homeless and living in poverty. These are political issues that we need to address. And the answers to those political issues need to be rooted in people's real lives. I'm fed up of having philosophical conversations about what is and what isn't a woman. This is about people's lives. Sometimes it's about life and death. And we need to stop scapegoating trans women as the enemy when actually we have a shared struggle, cisgender women, trans women, non-binary people. We have shared experiences, a shared struggle against misogyny and um, shared interests. And the other thing that I think is particularly worrying is the way that trans people are, by some, being um, set apart from the rest of the LGBTQ, or LGBTQ plus community, as though their interests and rights are somehow in conflict with our interests and rights, in, in the same way as some people pitch the interests of trans women as being antithetical to the interests of cisgender women. We always end this podcast with a with a big but simple question, which is if you could change the world any way, how would you change it? Obviously, as a socialist, I believe in the redistribution of wealth, but also the redistribution of power. And I think that the two are inextricably linked. So many people have a lack of power in our lives, in our communities, um, in our workplaces. And that power and wealth is concentrated in the hands of the super rich, in the hands of our bosses, of governments. Institutions that are all too often unaccountable. So we need a shift of power and wealth, an irreversible shift from the super rich to our communities and to workers who we've seen are getting us through this coronavirus crisis to the carers, like my former colleagues, cleaners, nurses, teaching assistants. I think that inequality and poverty and climate change, all of these things are symptoms of an imbalance of power. And then that imbalance of power sows division and sows hatred. So we need, we need to, to dismantle and reconstruct a system that has been rigged in favour of people who hoard power. We need to democratise 
democratised society, in our workplaces, um, democratise our communities. And we need to to put an end to the fact that the the world's richest 1% own as much wealth as 6.9 billion people. Nadia Whitam, thank you very much indeed for sharing your ways to change the world. Our producer is Rachel Evans. Until next time, bye-bye.